you look at bands that are successful, or you look at authors that are successful, things like that, they've actually been at it for 15 or 20 years, but no one ever heard of them. And then all of a sudden, they become in and vogue and contemporary. And, and they're the ones that have persevered through everything that it took. So that positive attitude gets you around so many other things, because life will be full of obstacles. And the next stage coming out of college, especially for this generation and the economy that we're in, will be very, very difficult. Um, so it's going to be your positive attitude in approaching that, your attitude in differentiating yourself from someone from, from the rest. Um, and you know, every time I come to Shimer, I tend to make one or two friends who I then communicate with uh, and watch their life ventures uh, go on. Um, but I, I truly think it's. It's the attitude that you bring to the approach. Um, again, you're going to have many people, the same as me, that say, Shimer, where is that? What is that? But the minute I educate them on the type of education I receive and so forth, most of the managers see merit in it um, and, uh, and, and see value. And then if I can present myself halfway intelligently, um, <coughs> I've always said if I can get in the room and get the interview, I can get the job. Uh, and that's an attitudinal approach, maybe. I, I do believe it because I think, um, and so it's getting through the door, getting that opportunity, and that comes from your, your attitude and your perseverance and you're really not giving in too easily. Yeah, perhaps I have a question that's a little off the mark, but you can help me with it anyway. As I understand it, you were at Shimer for two years, huh. and as I understand it, you had a, a, compared to the rest of us, an amazingly successful life. Today, you haven't died yet, so we go. <laughs> and I was just wondering, uh, would it make some sense for you to come back and get the other two years? I am just. Um, my partner in life, Rada, will tell you that um, I read um, a, a book by um, a Harvard professor, and it's called the Third Chapter, and it propositions that life it comes in kind of stages. And the first is, uh, is from your earliest years through your maturation, your 20s and so forth. The second stage of life is when you finish your education and so forth and you go into the business world and you have varying levels of, when I say business world, you go into whatever endeavor that you're in and you have what success you have. And that's the second chapter. And then you get to the point where you're finishing that and you think, well, what's next? And there's nothing I'd like better to do than go back and get the last <laughs> two years. Um, because those are the years that you go do whatever altruistically you wanted to do, something that you really cared about. Have a scholarship program. <laughs> 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 yes. Yes, it would. And others. Um, so uh, it's, it, it, uh, you know, and that third chapter is where I am in my life. And I'm but really. That facetious question was really built into how we could understand the urge for lifelong learning and the times you don't want to learn and the times you do want to learn. And, and that third stage is an important part of, Absolutely. of, of giving people some hope about uh, leading a better life. Absolutely. And it's, um, and it's not only uh, the hope, it's also the fulfillment in that self-actualization yeah, phase power of life, which is the, the highest strata of, of, of uh, fulfillment. Um, that the actualization of all that you can be. Um, the I, and, I, and it's Friday night, which is never my best time. But the <laughs> article, <laughs> the the article that you were talking in the book with the two guys did the yep. study. Yep. Okay, I can't remember their names right now. But Roscoe and uh, uh, I'll get you the other one. And the the part I know the. Chronicle of Higher Ed in their big write up on them was mentioned that they don't talk about the role of adjuncts. Yes. And the rise in adjuncts yeah. in the university. Yeah. And you didn't either. And, and I have addressed this, but I mean, I've taught at four different colleges and universities, including Shimer. And there's a huge difference. You know, and the other places I went, you know, taught here. And I left for personal reasons. Mm -hmm. And then I was an adjunct at two other local institutions. When I taught here, 
Yeah, I was a member of the faculty. You, know, I came in and did went to the faculty meetings, talked about the student yeah. development, and all these different things. You were part. It was a collegial environment. Yeah. As an adjunct, you don't get any of that. Right. You're excluded from right. all those discussions. You're excluded from how does this course fit in with the rest of the courses, even in, when you're teaching in a core program. Yes. And I think it would be really interesting to you know some. And there must be somebody doing this already to track. The, the results, when they talk about that students aren't learning in college, what relationship does that have with the rise of adjuncts in the institution? Uh, I, I, you know, and this is total speculation, but clearly there is a rise of that. I, the, the, it's internecine enough on a campus. I mean, I've seen professors fighting over a room with a window, mm -hmm. um, you know, or the head of the department who comes in and the whole poli-sci department kind of changes its ways and means and so <laughs> forth. Um, uh, I have found uh, that college uh, professors can be as, as parochial as any business person I ever met. And so that idea that adjuncts are a different group mm -hmm. does seem to me to be anathema, especially when you're bringing more and more of them in and they're actually teaching more and more of the, of the fundamental as professors get less and less engaged with the real learning because of their, you know, you know, so many places they want the writing, so many places they want the research, they want the dollars that go with that. And, um, and that's only, you know, but to me that wouldn't be a self-fulfilling, that wouldn't be a fulfilling part of being a professor. But, you know, the students, for me, as I say as an administrator, 17 years, and it, I was always blown away with the number of fellow administrators that knew nothing about what was going on in campus. And I was at everything and every, I always had students at every year for, uh, that I was their first year advisor and, um, and, uh, and so forth. And for me, I wanted to be part of this whole institution and anything that keeps you out as opposed to bringing you in is, a, is working opposite the desired result. And definitely I would imagine faculty feel really um, oh, yeah. Left out, you know, and you and so many classes now are being taught even not by adjuncts, but are being taught taught by graduate students. Mm -hmm. You know, at, at some institutions, you rarely see the professor whose name is in the syllabus. But don't you think that colleges and universities are getting caught budgetarily into this model at this point? Because oh, I sure, mean, yeah, and, it, and it, it's likely, you know, there's a reason that colleges are are costing more and more and more. And um, uh, I read one article that was interesting in preparation for this, that the proposition that a lot of this started when you got the last wave of the baby boomers and then there was this period, and those of you that have been through it would know where there was going to be a real shortfall in the number of prospective students. And at that time, all the costs started to rise um, dramatically because you had to make up for the shrinking base of potential students. And you really had to view how do we get how do we make as much money with as few with fewer students in the in the potential uh, bay? And they said that was the starting point when colleges and universities lost the discipline that they had for controlling expenditures and controlling expense in such a way. Uh, but before that, they were assured by the you know government paying for people who came out of the military and the, the huge wave of just people that were looking for an education in the United States following the Second World War and and my parents' generation, you know, with all the children that they had and. You know, as a baby boomer, you know, we all were focused on, on, and we were a big wave, but the wave after us was small. So we did not go forth and multiply as fast. <laughs> <laughs> sure. I just have sort of a personal timeline of when you graduated from college, and then there's some time between there till you become CEO yeah. of some significant yeah. corporations. Yeah. Something must have happened in those years. Yeah. <laughs> Assuming you weren't wandering in the desert. Yeah. <laughs> you know, this is this is attitude and whatever, but I was um, I was I first when I came out I went into and I had paid for my education at Shimer and and, and and elsewhere by working at a resort hotel. And it was um, a, a very fashionable uh, place, and I lived there all summer. And I started when I was 13, and I left when I was 21 or 22, and I was the assistant general manager of the place. 
And, uh, and it was really one of these elegant hotels. It, it had 60 rooms for chauffeurs and for nannies and things like that of the <laughs> people that would come to it. And, you know, I, had, I, I was the one that remembered that the president of GE, when he arrived, liked a firmer mattress than was in the room, but he always wanted room 701, so <laughs> changed the mattress in 701. I had the, so, so that's what started me in a passion around a type of business, and, and it was an easy business to go in. But the, my first two jobs were so simple, they, they were basically working with chains, which are cookie cutter, and they were easy to learn, but once you learned them, there was no fulfillment. So I would move up to district manager and regional manager, and, but I still wasn't fulfilled. So then I went into academia, and that was really for two reasons. <coughs> One, academia was the first time that I would let be who I am. It was the first time I could come out of, of being, uh, being an openly gay person and not having any worry about saying that. In fact, everyone would kind of think, well, maybe he is, so we need to introduce him to so-and-so and so-and-so. And so, and so, and so, and so uh, you know, they took you by the hand, and if you didn't know you were, they, and they thought you were, you were still going to be, uh, uh, meet people. So that was, that was really, um, and uh, that was really um, very, very helpful, because it's, if, you, if you're living a, a fictitious life, you're not going to be fulfilled. So academia was the first time that I really came through. So I'm successful at a couple of places, uh, two, UCLA and UC Irvine, and, and I moved up, I was number two at one, and then moved up to the head of administrative services at another. And again, because I had a business kind of discipline to me. And then all of a sudden, the Harvard opportunity came along. And, and, uh, and uh, it was a big position across 13 graduate schools and two, both uh, uh, Harvard and Radcliffe at the time. And, um, and it was the best time of my life because they really let me manage the business and uh, whatever. But then came that out of the blue opportunity, which was the Disney Corporation. And they came to me uh, for a position of vice president running theme parks. And, um, you know, how they ended up with someone on a college campus and so forth, it came down to just a headhunter who had heard me making some remarks at a conference and it was about service and so forth. And at Harvard, we really got, the department I headed up always was getting rave reviews from the students because we were very service-minded. If, if the student wanted something, we said yes. Whether it was the meal, if they said, I really feel like steak tonight, the direction was, go get them steak. You know, just come, <laughs> give us a minute, we'll go to the store, we'll have, and, and that yes mentality <laughs> everything. So that, that uh, so I mean, I was the hero in the Harvard Crimson, uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, because so many administrators, especially at a place of where you have a great sense of entitlement like Harvard, said no, 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 you can't do that, no, you can't, and ours was yes. Um, so, uh, but this one headhunter came, and she said, no, I just want to meet you It's for a position. And she didn't tell me where it was and so forth. And um, she flew out to Boston the day before Thanksgiving, which is the busiest day. She missed her Thanksgiving to meet with me Friday. So, so and then, she, you know, we talked for eight hours. Um, and uh, so at the end of it, she said, well, this is an opportunity you need to go for. And I said, no, I, I, I'll give you an answer, but I don't really think. And she was telling me, you know, Michael, there are lots of digits after the number of digits that are in your page. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you, know, you, can, you can add to that. And, uh, and I said, yeah, I know. But uh, And again, the altruism of a Shimer education, <laughs> I was happy. I was totally content. Um, and, the, uh, and then there was this uh, man, Pella Pressler, who was, who was thought to might be Michael Eisner's successor. And that was who I was going to be reporting to. And he was, um, I, I said, I went out, I interviewed with him, and so forth. The day he interviewed, he wasn't feeling very well, and I, I didn't feel any energy in the interview, so I thought, well, I've always thought I didn't go. Well, everyone else I interviewed with didn't have the flu that day. And <laughs> so he said, well, maybe I missed something. And if, in fact, he liked a guy from Chicago here who I know very, very well, <laughs> and he is now the president of the big corporation. Uh, and um, he, uh, uh, so we went out, he said, uh, so I told him, no, I don't want the job. And I flew off to London because at the same time, the dean and the president of Harvard were trying to get me to say no. They said, no, just tell us what, what it would take to keep you here, you know? And so I flew off to London to get my head together. <laughs> bam, bam, bam on the door. 
and its Disney representatives in London. <laughs> and, uh, Disney. Yeah, yeah. And so I'm going, what are you doing? And uh, uh, they said, well, you know, Paul didn't like the fact that you said no. And uh, so he, he thinks that the only way to have this dialogue is if he comes to meet you personally, and you have to tell him no, not us. You have to tell him no. And I said, well, I've already told the dean I'm staying. I've told President Rudenstein that I'm staying. I'm really happy and, and so forth. And uh, and anyway, I met with him. He was we, we had a great conversation. And it, and the reason I left was not all the money because it really was it was at least ten times what I was making at Harvard, and I was a very well paid administrator at Harvard. But what was amazing was I saw someone that I said I can grow under this leadership, and I had to make a decision. Am I in for 25 more years at Harvard, and I'll be very successful, and I'll be very happy, but that's where I'll be? Or is this one more step to take in a continuing process? And, and stage two of my life, is there something else? And so it was, I had to one, see if I could be successful in that environment. Um, and then it moved very fast. I just, um, the, the job, at Barnes and Noble, which again was took me up a big step, uh, was an interview where I flew in, met with the owner. You know, three hours later, he's going, "Don't let him get out of the building without a contract." And it was, you know, and that's not the way you do business. I mean, it takes to get an executive position takes months of interviewing and so forth. And it was like, and I had to give a speech that night down in, or the next day down in New Orleans. And uh, it was like, no, no, you can't leave New York until you get. And which is a nice position to be in if you're <laughs> on that end of things. But life hit me with these things in a row that just were, uh, and, and, and they all came from that thing and answer the question about what's next, getting in the door and making the best representation of what I could do or how I thought I could add value. Um, so it was meteoric. I mean, I didn't, I didn't understand it myself. Um, and it, there was no rhyme or reason to it. How Disney ever got my name with that headhunter other than she happened to see me somewhere, giving a probably much more lucid speech than tonight. <laughs> than <laughs> rest of her, so. You say it was New York. How long were you actually at Harvard? Uh, seven years. Okay, that's a slow New York. <laughs> <laughs> is that recruiter around? Yes, <laughs> 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 yeah, Elizabeth <laughs> Hamilton was the name. Yeah, I'll come right back to you. Um, uh, part of that getting in the door was, as you mentioned, the brand, and uh, that's one thing yeah. a Shimer graduate faces. Uh, I, I guess I'm asking for your personal opinion if there's anything that Shimer needs to or would benefit from uh, would benefit from doing that that uh, might, to use the, the corporate language, grow that brand, and uh, how Shimer could stand to benefit from things like that. Yeah, I think. Um, you know, as I said, unknown, unsung, unusual did it for me. And I think it did it for quite a few people. Um, but those articles don't come very often, and it was such a good piece. I do think one of the critical aspects of Shima thriving is how to build that brand, because it is the brand. And, and because if you get inside and start to understand it, you understand the innate power and um, of an education that you will get if, if you immerse yourself in it. And, and I think it stands on something. But St. John's has been there for a year, and they, they have some of the similar problems um, in how is it that you get recognized. I did think, and, and it was the British period I was helping on the board, coming into the town was a big help in getting away from Waukegan and building a brand. I do think there's a lot of work still to how does you know, it was different when it was the University of Chicago and Hutchins come in, they came in and changed it. That's, that's different. That's uh, an institution that had been known for rigor and so forth. And it's still to this day. So I do think the essence of a brand is that brands are very, very powerful. I know you have the makings of a great brand, but how to communicate it. And, you know, um, I just did a little blurb downstairs for a film that they're doing. And, um, but there has got to be some word, way to get the word out as to the, the, the value of this education. Because I'm telling you, you cannot help but leave more fulfilled, both personally and also up here, intellectually. Uh, because um, 
even at Harvard, and I had, as I said, I stayed with the students. I knew them for years. They still come to our house. Um, and um, I, lo I, I love the, and, and I love the intelligence they had, the way they, they had self-discipline and so forth. But I still didn't think they get the education that you're going to get here. But obviously they had the brain. You know, it was 370 some odd years. 75. 75 years now. Uh, that helps build the brain. But, but um, uh, I, I wish I had the answer to that because I think it's the golden, the golden whatever to solving the, the, the problem. Um, because it, it will just drive more students. It will, it's the whole institution will thrive as a result of it. And I wish I knew the easy answer to it. I will tell you that brain building is very, very powerful tool. And brain building is also very, very difficult because it, it, there are very, very few things that, but you know, you use Tide because your mother used Tide. You know, so there are, there are aspects of things we do just because of the brand. At Disney, we used to come here to Chicago and when we were building a new theme park, we would spend three or four days just scripting a one-line sentence that was the essence of the brand. Um, and we would bring 10 executives, and then we'd have 10 people from this brand management company working with us to try to, how do you break through and describe in a very succinct way what this entity is, and how is it distinguishable from our other entities, and so forth. And uh, I, I had no idea it took that complexity. But I, I loved having up to be part of it. Matter of fact, that's an introduction we ought to make to see if they don't want some um, do some pro bono stuff. <laughs> yeah. I hear you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I gotta, I, I'll look that up. That's a good idea. I, I'm going there and then I'll be right back. What's been the most fulfilling part of your business experience? Um, having, it's always the people you work with. Um, it's always that. Uh, and feeling that you've impacted them in some way or not. Uh, I could walk across the campus at Harvard. I could walk across Disney. Um, I could fly around the country in Barnes and Noble. And it wasn't until, you know, I, 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 it's the essence. You deliver the product with your people. And so you have to be there for them, and they have to have a confidence in your leadership. And, and equally, I, you know, uh, many of the places have been union environments I work in. No union is going to work harder to protect my people than I am. I'm sorry, I, I have a vested interest in their personal success. I take every issue they have at home and so forth. So I love the interaction with the people. You know, when you take a Disney, you, you're out there asking them to go to the highest levels of service. And you can't do that with, unless you're willing to treat them exactly the same way. And they know that M Mike will be highly respectful of me. Um, and uh, so seeing people thrive in, that, in their own environment and then being part of their maturation and opening doors for them, that's another very, very fulfilling thing when you say, yeah, no, I'll get you that interview. I know how. <laughs> so I know someone that knows someone that knows someone. I'm, I'm interested in the language you're using to talk about education. And um, the gentleman's question over here about the um, corporate language or, or institutional language that we're using fascinates me. And I'm, Wondering more about your description of education as a product. Yes. Um, this intrigues me, and I guess I'd like to hear more about who is responsible for producing this product. Um, and if the metaphor works, are students buying it? Are they consuming it? And if so, um, do we not lose some of the responsibility they need to have in that creation of this product? Or Well, um, to take the first part of it, I do think it. Uh, that it has to be looked at as a product, given the enormous expense that someone is going to, to uh, ask of their family or themselves, the amount of debt they're going to take on, and so forth. So it, it has to be looked at as something that I am buying, because I could take my time, energy, let alone my money, and, and use it somewhere else. So there is some essence of it that has to be viewed as we're selling something. Now, uh, you know, clearly, there's an altruistic reason that colleges and universities exist. But there's also a real reason, not a real, another reason, a business reason, and um, as to why they uh, are or not successful. And as a, um, you know, I, at the University of New Hampshire, we have the same thing. We're now up to 51% out-of-state students to get the difference in the tuition. So I mean, there's, 
you know, and, and I'm, I think I'm the only person on the Board of Trustees that's from New Hampshire. Uh, left. And, uh, and I keep saying, but isn't it a little bit about providing an education for those people in the state of New Hampshire? Or isn't it about being a resource for the state of New Hampshire, given that, now, there's a good argument against that. The state only gives us 11% of our funding, so it's not, it's 50th out of 50 states in terms of the amount of state funding. So they can make a real good argument back to me that when that number goes up, we'll be more interested in, <laughs> in New Hampshire. Um, now, uh, to, the, to the latter part of it, the, the student um, investment, um, I think the students have made one big investment when they make the decision, the buy decision, uh, or the, the, the decision to choose an institution over another institution. Um, and so I think they've already put an enormous amount of confidence and that I'm going to give you four years of my life, I'm going to give you four years for you to mold me, and I think that I'm going to come out better as a result of going here than going somewhere else. Mm -hmm. So I think there is something that a student brings. They also bring a, a vitality and a, and a um, shine wouldn't work if it weren't for students that were seriously interested in reading materials and dialoguing with others and, and getting as deep uh, down into that text as possible, um, so, um, or those works as, as possible. So um, I, I think that's their initial investment. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and, and it, by the way, it's one of those that it's like uh, having a child and then breaking up, you're going to, you know, you've got 18 years of dealing with that. Here, you, you know, for many students, they're going to have years of paying off and so forth, so there's a big there is a big investment, and so I think it's important that the student also take as much out of it as possible. And, you know, as I said, the product is not what you put into it, but what you take out of it. For so, for every student, you, you know, I, I find the ones that are, you know, especially at UNH when I teach a class, I know that's a skater, that's a skater, that's a skater. They're just skating by, and you know, they they wasted four years and whatever money. But by the way, they're having a good time. I did read one other article, but I just couldn't put it up here that said. The only reason colleges, colleges exist is because the parents don't watch anymore. I actually had that as my first slide, and I said, oh, I can't start with such a... And it was, it was on someone's blog. And by the way, the only reason you're at school is because you want to party, and this and that. And, and it was such a, you know, such a lowball view of things. <laughs> and, uh, by the way, your question was very deep, and I, I'm sure I didn't go deep enough on it. But uh, Thank you. Uh, well, first I have a, a short question. Uh, you spoke before about the uh, 360 um, assessment, yep. or, uh, and you said that about 60% of businesses uh, uh, use it. Did, did you mean, uh, I, I think you, you must have meant large businesses, right? Well, no. Uh, yeah, I, I doubt a mom and pop restaurant is using it. Uh, <laughs> it, it. It is more endemic to a corporate environment where they, over a period of time, have tried to find tools and instruments that will let them critique their most important resource, which is their people. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, I think it's definitely, when I say 60, is probably more corporate than, than small or entrepreneurial and or mom and pops. And things. Okay, now the other thing is, uh, in, in a way, uh, education is, is a product. Uh, certainly, people pay a lot of money for it. Mm -hmm. um, but whether you call it a product or something else, um, how, how, who determines what that product, if you want to call it that, is to be, it is. Uh, it, because it seems to me that uh, there, in determining what the product is, uh, it, a business consideration should not be the main consideration. No, but it's a necessary component. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and and, and Scheimer is a case study for that, by the way, in my mind, because this is something that continues on despite enormous uh, economic obstacles to, you know, actually thriving. But I mean that not, not disrespectfully, but it is one that has always had to be able to get through on very limited resources and produce the result that they want. And that's why I say I'm so amazed at the number of of the of, of the teaching staff that stay here because that is a 
that has been one of the reasons why is because there's so much institutional knowledge and caring about each student that comes through the door. You know, you all know each other. You're, as I said, it has a familial feel when you arrive at China that everyone knows everyone. That doesn't happen on most campuses. You know a very, you know, you, you either know your group or whatever, but it's not the, the way it happens, the dynamic that happens here. So, so that to me is part of the product and part of what needs to be in that brand, uh, uh, in the brand and, and so forth is, is the true value in some, something like that that is just a spur way to educate. Um, but, but the cost, you know, again, I come back to the cost is not what it costs you to do, even though that's the way you have to play it because that's the cars that you've been built. But the true, you know, the true price that someone's willing to pay is going to ultimately come down to do they derive that amount of value out of it. You know, when you go out looking for cars, you look at this one, that one, and you, you know. But you can go to a Harvard and you could buy two and a half Bentleys for a four year education <laughs> if you were into cars <laughs> and drive around very handsomely and <laughs> sell them. <laughs> um, so it, uh, it has. Yes. I, I just believe products have value and you have to ensure that you deliver. Yeah. You know, maybe I was thinking consumers, for example, they yeah. do help yeah. shape what the product is by what they demand, um, mm -hmm. particular changes in the product that they like and don't like, and their continual feedback. Um, and then it, that's, that contributes to a kind of creative process between the you know, producers and the consumers. And maybe the same could be said for education where you have the students who will be the consumers in this case, yeah. giving continual feedback yes. and you know demanding different things and shaping the product in a more creative process. Well, certainly students have a, a, a big say in it uh, from the standpoint, but, um, but again, part of the very idea is that you're educating, uh, but that does not mean that, that every time that you're selling anything, you have to look to the buyer and see what are the needs of the buyer. Mm -hmm. and But I've always found China to be very open to that kind of process. And and unfortunately, one of the limitations is sometimes is just the budget, because I have no doubt in the people that have been associated with this institution want it to be more and more realize its full potential. And, um, and, uh, and I'm one of those. And and students have a, a big role in that. Uh, but I watch the number of students come back and are, you know, try to stay uh, attached to the college in, in some way or another. Um, you know, we were just one last thought on that. You know, most, the number of people that have graduated from Shimer over its whole history that are alive is one class in a major state university, yeah. something yeah. like that. Yeah. You know, one class. So, you know, you go fundraising and all the traditional things that you do, you just go, that's not open. So, I've always thought that China's success would ultimately will come down to some foundation or some uh, source like that that just says, hey, this is something, education isn't working at many levels. Here's another way, here's something that's a whole different way of doing it. Let's fund it for four or five years to see what it can be. And during that time, the institution would have that opportunity to not have to be worried about every little thing every minute. You know, whether it's the Gates Foundation or who, just find that one that says it, it's meritorious given what we're up against in the higher education today. So, yeah. I was reading about it just to kind of like, I'm not trying to come in here like next year, hopefully huh? for the weekend program, but I was actually reading about it. That blew me away that, that, that again, that because of the mod, and obviously because I'm applying it, it feels to me, but it blew me away that I, that the, the concept is so it's fascinating, but no one's actually going to a foundation like this. This, you know, it, just, it blew me dead. I, I was like, wow, yeah. you know, because the money is there. The money is there, and, oh, it's, sure. and, it's, it's, and it's 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 a it's um you know him better than most of from, from a business background. You know that it's boom, it's just scalable. It's like boom, put it in there and get it doing, and then concentrate on the product rather than yeah. on trading water. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean. I, I don't know. The budget's three million a year. I mean, that's but that's so thick in, 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 in most in the most world. Things, and so, so you know, my thought has always been it has to be someone somewhere that understands this model. And, yeah, and um, and uh, so, you know, I think that's probably what you think of every day. What everyone thinks of: who is that one, or what is that one entity? So 
I won't take any more of your time. It's been a, a, a real pleasure, and I appreciate the dialogue. And we can continue.